Welcome to the Superstar Communicator Podcast. My name is Susan Heaton Wright, a leading impact speaking and communications expert. My aim is to show you how to make an impact so you will be heard, listened to, and respected for career success. Listen weekly to the podcast and go to our website, superstarcommunicator.com. Hello, everybody. This is Susan Heaton Wright from Superstar Communicator. Thank you very much for tuning in today. We have a fantastic episode, and I know that you are really, really going to get a lot out of this. I certainly got a lot out of the interview. But before we talk about this interview, I wanted to share with you one or two things about Superstar Communicator. You know, as well as I do, that Superstar Communicator is all about you, everybody, empowering everybody to present the best version of themselves in all business conversations, whether that is that you're doing public speaking or pitching or presenting or meeting. This could be online, it could be face to face, but I am passionate about ensuring that you all show up and are the best version of yourselves when you are speaking and having conversations in business situations. I work with people who on their individual presentation skills or career development or alternatively with teams whether that is that as a team they're working on presentation skills, working on a particular pitch, or developing their interpersonal skills so that they can work more efficiently as a team. Please feel free to arrange a call, either the person who is involved in organizing training and professional development. I will leave a link for you to book a call. I'd love to have a chat with you and we can discuss different options that will work for you. And individually, if you want to develop your communication skills, why not join us for the monthly Lunch and Learn, which is always on the last Tuesday of the month. The way that you can find out about these is to register at superstarcommunicator.com forward slash webinar dash interest and you will be kept up to date with the latest topic that we're discussing. As I speak, last month was how to say no with impact and this month is how to listen with impact. Get your team along so that you can all acquire these skills. Okay, so let's go back to the interview. I am absolutely delighted to have on the other end of the internet both Emil Dobrovsky and Octavian Pantis, who have co-written a book called Dark Cockpit. And this is all about communicating, leading and being in control at all times, like an airline pilot. Now, let me give you a secret. Emil is actually an airline pilot and he has given loads of examples of how we need to be human when we are communicating, when we are working as a team leader. He needs to reassure everybody who is on the plane that he is flying that they are going to be safe. But equally, he needs to make sure that his team work efficiently and they can talk to him if need be. And he gives an example of that. One of the challenges of the way that his industry works is that quite often, you will have a team where people have not met each other beforehand and he might not have worked with members of the team. There will be people at all different levels of their professional development and yet he has to build a team quite quickly. 
and Octo Octavian is a leadership coach and so he's able to bring in a leadership perspective. I found this particular interview absolutely fascinating because not only have I led a team of musicians over a number of years with my other business Viva Live Music, as an opera singer and a classical singer they call you the leading lady. In other words, there are situations where everybody looks to you for reassurance and for the lead. And I absolutely understand where Emil is coming from because sometimes we have to reassure as a leader. But sit back and listen to this incredible interview. Yeah, it's, I'm in my uniform. Uh, I'm... Uh, I'm in my uniform as I'm a captain flying for the Romanian national carrier Tarom and I've been an instructor for the last uh, 18 years um, holding uh, the privilege of uh, European uh, Aviation Ag Safety Agency and I've been uh, doing this uh, my whole life so I'm a professional pilot and I talk to people that's why I'm here. Oh brilliant. So welcome everybody I am absolutely delighted to have two gentlemen as my guests on the superstar communicator podcast you will get why i was so keen to have them on the podcast you are going to get so much out of this podcast we have emil who is a captain he is a pilot for the romanian airlines and has been for a number of years, and Octavian, who is a communications expert, a little bit like me, and a trainer. So welcome, both of you. Thank you very much for the invitation, and hello to everybody who's listening. And, nice to be here. Oh, it's absolutely wonderful. And they have jointly written a book called Dark Cockpit. And essentially, well, I'm going to let them discuss this. Why did you write this book? You want to start, Emil, or shall I? No, I will let you, Octavian, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a huge treasure of know-how in aviation, not only about how to actually fly an airplane from the engine's perspective and aerodynamics, but also from the perspective of communication and managing crisis and being in control and leading uh, others. Just for uh, information, uh, before COVID hit, they were, there were around 200,000 flights per day, commercial flights per day. The peak was on, I think, June 19th, on 2019, where there are 250,000 commercial flights per day. Now you can imagine how many things need to go right, need to properly function to make everything possible. And, and if we talk about communication, imagine the huge amounts of communication that takes place between the tower and the cockpit, inside the cockpit, between the co-pilot and the captain, uh, and then the planning and then the leadership. So there's a, there's a treasure of know-how. And we wanted to make this know-how available, not just to pilots, but to everybody who's not piloting a plane, but who are piloting their own careers, who are piloting a project, a team of some kind. Um, because there's, it's super useful what's, uh, what's, what's there, and we wanted to make it available to a larger scale. Brilliant. The book's uh, history began uh, like seven years, eight years ago, when I, was, uh, I started talking in front of other people than my pilots or other people out of my industry, my airline industry. And um, we met, both Octavian and me, and um, we started working together. And little by little, we came up to this uh, conclusion that uh, we have to write a book. Actually, he told me once, Emil, your amazing stories, uh, they are uh, sending bridges through other uh, industries. Uh, you should write a book. And I think for a second, I said, look, Octa by the way, Octavian is a well-known author in Romania and not just in Romania. He has a very good, he has a very reputation as an author. So I said, look, let's, why, why not uh, writing it together? So uh, we start uh, writing this book based on my stories. And Octavian has a very good eye on thinking, on seeing things that other people, they don't see. Let me give an example. Uh, he told me once, he said, look, uh, you realize that you have a new team every day. 
yeah, in a large company, you can fly with a crew and uh, maybe for a year, we'll never fly with them again. So we have to present in front of them as a, not just as a boss. Everybody knows who you are because you have four stripes. Yeah. But uh, um, in top of that, you have to, uh, to present as a leader in front of them <clears throat> to help you in any case of an emergency and, or just simply uh, uh, to finish your flight. And he said, look, you, you imagine that you are a new leader in front of your new team every day. And if you think like this, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? And we, we do something well to, to, to come up with a new team every day, with a new leader every day who express, uh, communicates and uh, solve things together. Yeah. And that, by the way, became a title in the book, a new team every day inside. Uh -huh. The book is structured on three parts. The first part is on communication. Yes. The second one is on leadership. And the third part is on how can you be more in control? How can you prepare and what to do when crisis hits? And in the second part where we talk about leadership, one of the chapters is called A New Team Every Day. And in yes. that, we talk about five things that you do, that you can do to quickly gain trust and keep trust yes. and to set the standards at a very high level so that you can perform together with the, the other ones. You know, it's really interesting you talk about leadership. Um, I know in the next year, the book market will be flooded with Olympians who, um, how to win a gold medal and how to lead a team and how to win a business. And yet that is so far away from certainly my life. Yet this book is so relatable. Yeah. Yeah, actually, we didn't uh, want to, to write a book to show people how to do things. If uh, they don't do like us, they will fail. Okay, so we, they are, we are just giving examples uh, based on my experience. I have more than 13,000 hours as a, uh, as a pilot, and I have more than 6,000 hours in the full fly simulators, training and checking people. So based on this experience, experience we just show a way to do things well a way to communicate because everything starts with the communication yeah. in a cockpit when you start an sop when you start an action first first of all it's a standard call or is a call this is a trigger a trigger for the action so the pilots are, are communicating well because otherwise they are they're being in, in a possibility to fly actually we have a very it's a sad word that aviation history was written in blood and for us, the communication is a paramount, is a paramount impor, importation, uh, importance. Yeah. importance. Yeah. So for us, it's very important. And we know that. And imagine the, the surrounding, imagine the ambiental uh, surrounding of a pilot. We are sitting in a, in a dark cockpit, not seeing each other to validate uh, with our gestures or with our body language, yes. uh, to validate the message. And we are looking forward. We have headsets on our ears. You hear lots of communication through the air between other pilots and the uh, air traffic controllers. And you have intercommunication. You have uh, lots of other um, noises. And you have to pass at a certain moment a message which will be sent directly. And it's uh, without, uh, uh, I would say, it's perfect sent and it's uh, received. Now, that was one thing that I was going to ask you about, because obviously the language of aviation is English. And with respect, both of you speak English as your non-native tongue. How are you able to make the English language an international language so that everybody that was, is within the industry is able to communicate effectively and to avoid any danger? Uh, first of all, we said, uh, we are saying that in a cockpit, the common language is SOP, is standard operating procedure. Okay. Then, <laughs> this is the common which language. Happens to be written, which happens to be in English, by the way. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah. yeah. So it's very, it's very difficult because in a cockpit, you can have different persons from different cultures, from different yes. backgrounds, with different education. So it's a matter of uh, SOP to put them together on the same page all the time, in the same cockpit. Uh, language is, um, is a second, uh, let's say, concern in a cockpit because we have uh, to simplify the, uh, the English language. We have a standard phraseology, but in fact, this standard phraseology and uh, the standard calls, we have them in the uh, SOP 
they are not, uh, how you say, they will not cover the whole situations. So sometimes you have to pass other way the message. In uh, sometimes you let them pilot just pass the message in their own language if they are both Romanians, if yeah. they are both yeah. French, or if they are both uh, I don't know Italians. But uh, most importantly, and to, to keep in mind that the, the new team every day composed by different people with different background and education. Yeah. And yeah, English, uh, it's not so much as a concern because uh, you have limited uh, amount of, uh, let's say, standard phraseology to send a message between pilots. Okay. If, if I may add here something very, very practical that our listeners can take right away, and if they use yeah. it already, that's wonderful. Um, it's important that people understand the same things to the same words. In aviation, there was a lot of research and study and practice. So when somebody says um, uh, 100 knots, the other one says check, or when one one says speed in business or in organizations, people use words like it's urgent, this is urgent, could you deal with it, this is urgent. Now, they may both understand English and what urgent means, but in fact, for some people, urgent means I drop everything else and I work yes. on what you've asked me right now. But in, for other people, urgent mean, means, hey, yeah, okay, so more or less today, the latest tomorrow, I should get it done uh, for you. So what is one thing that we can do whenever we have new people coming on board or we work with the national team? Let's define some terms, like what is urgent? What does success mean? We're gonna have a, a, we have to have a successful launch. Okay, let's be more specific. What do you mean by that? beyond the gram grammar uh, itself, but what is success? We want to be at 100 or 110 or, or let's have a great party for our customers. Okay, what does it mean? Because for some people, a great party might mean something. For other people, it might mean others. So the sooner uh, people clarify what we mean by this and by, I want to have a peaceful evening, says she or he. What does it mean? We have to clarify. Of course, the more people know each other, the easier it is for them to understand. Yes. I know what you mean when you say when peaceful, okay, I'm going to go fishing, I'm going to let you stay home by your, and that's, and that's fine. Or in other families, the meaning might be different. Or in, in some companies, when it's urgent, they only use urgent when it means drop everything else yeah. and focus yeah, on this yeah. now. So the sooner we, make, we take the efforts to clarify the words and the meanings with everyone we work with, uh, the better it is for, for instance, a customer might say to us, um, uh, I was unhappy with the other supplier, so I, I'm, I'm thinking about changing it and we're looking at you. Okay, what does it mean they were unhappy with the previous supplier? We must not assume that it was quality or the, that it was price or whatever. We have to ask. So the more yes. we ask, the more we make sure that we understand what the other person means, the easier it will be for us to be the preferred supplier that our customer is looking for. It's interesting because one of the questions I was going to ask you was related to how every industry has its own jargon or yeah. technical terms. And in a way, you've you've answered that. But how as um, within the aviation industry, how do you almost reframe some of your terminology so that people like me can understand it? So first of all, through our examples in the book, we are um, basically all my speeches are, are meant to send the bridges between aviation and other, other industries. So every time I have an audience and I know who I'm talking with, yes. I'm, I, I'm um, uh, calibrating my message and I, I have all the time I have stories. Imagine I have yes. stories in yes. 13,000 hours. I have lots of stories in aviation. And I, I, I flew all over the world. I flew in different situations. I flew for a company. I flew for, I was a test pilot. I was uh, flying the presidential and governmental flights in my country and not just in my country. So I have lots of stories. They, they can send a message. Of course, for us in the cockpit, when somebody says something, means something for us, the pilots. Yes. But uh, it has a, a very good um, you know, understanding for others. Let's say, let me say, let me tell you a short story. If I'm in the cockpit and I'm doing something in a very crowded environment, uh, approaching landing in Heathrow, let's say, there are lots of aircraft in the same time in the same uh, airspace, and you have um, 
limited period of time to communicate with the traffic controller. You have limited time to, to obey or to follow the orders or to reduce speed or to descend, to configure the aircraft. You have to prepare for landing. And you are, you, there are two aircraft in front of you, three other after you. So if you do a mistake, you'll just be put aside, you know, in a standby or something, and you will consume fuel. So it's a huge pressure on us. In that moment, if my co-pilot, he or she might be unexperienced, ab initio, with 250 hours, if I hear them yelling almost at me, landing gear down, I will realize in a second that actually I was called twice before to, for the action. And I was so focused on my actions, or I was trying to, to cope with other, my workload. I, I had a huge amount of work on my shoulder and I didn't hear yet. So this feedback of rise, raising their voice and asking me to lower the gear, I will simply thank them because in other places, if somebody which is in, uh, who yells at the superior or to uh, the boss or to the leader, I'm not sure this will work, but in my job, I will simply thank them, thank them because they helped me with this feedback. They found a way that maybe they said once with a lower voice, a gear down. I didn't hear it because it was a, another conversation, conversation in my headset mm -hmm. in that moment, or maybe I didn't uh, hear them. Maybe here they say again, uh, low landing gear down. When they say landing gear down, and I realized that I, uh, I missed two other calls, I will lower the gear. And instead of uh, punishing them, look, come on, we know you are, who you're talking with. I'm the, your boss, I'm your captain, I'm more experienced than you. No, I simply thank them. After landing, we have no time there. So after landing, I say, thank you very much for your yeah. way to find, to find a way to uh, send the message for me to lower the gear. You know, accepting feedback makes my project, my flight better. Actually, it's, um, I know it's non-intuitive because uh, if you accept feedback or criticism for other people in your team, even that they are inferior to your position, this will make you better. This will give you a way, um, way to step back, you know, to have a good, a better overview. It will ease your work, work, a workload, actually. What Do is... you know, I, I, uh, sorry, Octavian, you were going may, to... May I just add, what was fascinating uh, for me to discover in aviation while working with Emil in these years and everything is how everything in aviation is focused on getting any problem solved and on the future. It's not on feelings. It's not on... That's why what, what Emil is saying is, hey, I'm not taking it personally. Why do you shout? Who are you to... No, it's, it's, it has to do with landing gear. We have to landing gear down. By contrast, in many cases in life, something is being said and we add a lot of nuances to it. What do you mean? And who are you? And why did he say, why did he say that to me like that? What is he, what is he trying to say? I'm not good. And hey, hey, just differentiate between what was being said and what is just possible scenarios in my head in aviation because they're very busy and things need to get down right needs to get done right every single time they don't worry about all these things and it's they're focused on um, solving problems and if i may quickly add one more here about communication when what whatever communication is addressed to passengers is very carefully phrased so again, if we're meeting over a coffee with some friends, that's fine. But if you're designing some phrasing for customers in an email, in a message, in package, it has to be carefully phrased. For instance, uh, one thing that will ring about it, in the unlikely event of an emergency, right? That's the phrasing that's being used about masks. and everything. They don't say, well, just in case we crash, uh, there's a mask <laughs> that you... Because if they said that, it would be panic throughout the place. No, in the event of an emergency, in the unlikely, so they they they're perfectly <laughs> added. In the unlikely event of an emergency, mask will come down, put yours first, and everything, right? For the for your safety and security, flight attendants will do whatever they're so they're carefully phrased. And uh, uh, this is an invitation for every one of our listeners who is involved in phrasing messages to customers, to new employees, to whoever, to suppliers, even if you're or sending an email or whatever, be sure to reread it. Yes. Uh, and be sure to make, be sure to uh, phrase it nicely so that even if the receiver will have the scenario uh, or habit that we said does not happen in aviation, even then they don't go too far away from what you were trying to say. 
That's so interesting because I don't know if you know that my background before I was an opera singer and backstage. Uh -huh. <laughs> I suspect there are similarities that people shout at each other because there's something coming down and, yep. you know, it can be dangerous. And afterwards, everybody hugs everybody else because we know that in the moment that person was thinking of you yeah, and thinking of your, your best needs. But yeah. I love the fact that your attitude is not being a leader that's full of ego yeah thinking of the bigger picture and you tell the story of that a new person that was very very inexperienced in the team that you hadn't worked with but they were very inexperienced altogether and they came up and said to you look the lights are flickering at the back of the of the the plane yeah and somebody that was perhaps less or, or, or more experienced might not have been as um happy to talk to you yeah um and i thought that that was really good that you didn't think oh this this is a junior why on earth are they wasting my time but that they valued your contribution and it happened to be a game changer yes smoke yeah, yeah. so a lot in a, a lot has to do with uh, communicating in the right way and sometimes it's not super sophisticated things but the simple things done well for instance feedback yes if if the tower says to uh, the cockpit maintain heading to six zero for instance the captain responds right away or the co-pilot whoever is in charge of communication eh, repeating the message just yes. to make sure that yes. we, we tell you we understood we're fine imagine what would it look like imagine if this was a movie where, where uh, some action movie some one of the action heroes there and there seems to be some trouble with the airplane and the tower tells the plane maintain heading 260 and there would be no feedback from the captain we would immediately think that something's wrong there because yes. you, you can't imagine that happening in reality there's always feedback Again, by contrast, in reality, sometimes um, people communicate something and don't ask for feedback or we receive yeah. a message and we just say, OK, but what does OK mean? Uh, uh, what does, so, does everybody know what they've got to do? And they're going to go, yes. Yeah, yeah. They don't Any want to questions? No. No. And, uh, okay, see you next uh, Friday or whatever. Uh, but who knows what will happen uh, from now to next Friday because we did not take enough time to to check everything and what you what what. Our, our listeners will discover in the book if, if they, by the, by the way, if our listeners go to darkcockpitbook.com, they can read a chapter for free. Chapter five, a new team every day, by the way, oh, which is brilliant. a very dense chapter. And, uh, and listeners, I will make sure that I put the, all of okay. these links in the, um, the, the notes so that you'll be able to access that and also buy the book. Thank you. Uh, the most difficult thing in a team is to let people know that they can give you feedback as yeah. a leader. This is because there are lots of constraints, okay? There are educational constraints. You're coming from different parts of the world. <clears throat> Maybe in your family, education is uh, with the head of the family being a, a big figure and everybody else are subordinate to that or other, other, uh, other um, scenarios like these educational scenarios. But in a team, when our people are so different, the most difficult thing is to let them know that they give you feedback. And this starts with a briefing. This starts with the first moment you meet them. This starts with your action. Because uh, willing or not, the, when you are a captain, you are in front of them as a leader and you are an example for them. So uh, every time I'm doing a flight, I take it very responsible. I take it very serious. I'm the first there. I'm preparing uh, before the flight, so I know what to say. I know how to present the flight uh, um, details to them. I asked everybody a short question to know that they're on the same page with me. I let them know that if the flight is important for me, as any other flight, that the passengers are important to me. Doesn't matter the weather, doesn't matter the small defects of the aircraft, doesn't matter how many we are now, because sometimes we are over in, in a crew, sometimes we are just minimum cabin crew or a minimum uh, cockpit crew. So it doesn't matter how many we are going to that metal tube with wings and seats and engines and systems and hydraulics and so forth. 
doesn't matter if you have to, the, our mission, our, uh, our project is to fly the passengers from po point A to point B in a safe manner and comfortable, this is what we do. And as exactly like Octavian said, we are looking for the future, we are looking to solve things. So things between us, of course we are humans, but in the cockpit, in the cabin, the communication should be impersonal. So if somebody sends me any uh, an, uh, uh, feedback or criticism, I'm, I'm immediately, uh, my antennas are, you know, immediately in alert because there's something wrong in my, in my, uh, in my aircraft. And uh, somehow it's, um, it's good for us because we are formed this way. Imagine this metal tube flying at 11 uh, kilometers in the air, 39,000 feet. You cannot stop there. You cannot hold, put the parking brake and solve the things like a man do or you know, whatever that means, you know? So we have to, to figure out a way to let everybody know that you are in the team. They are important for you, each one of them. The youngest, the most unexperienced one in the back of the aircraft is important to you. That's, you, that's how you solve things. Because if that person uh, um, there to give you the feedback, it's a successful flight for sure. Oh, that's a brilliant answer. Now, I am aware that there is, is a chapter really on fear because I don't know about, about you, but I would certainly be fearful in certain situations in an aeroplane as a passenger. But as a leader and as the captain, how do you manage your fear? Look, um, first of all, I'm human. So yes. of course I get uh, afraid sometimes because sometimes uh, um, the only time actually when I went afraid was when my daughter was a passenger with me. She was nine at the time. My eldest daughter, she, she was back in, uh, in the uh, passenger cabin and we went through some uh, thunderstorm areas. So it was a little bit of a moderate turbulence or so. So that, that's my only time because I, I wondered what she was doing in the back. You know, maybe she gets afraid, maybe she's alone because she was alone, you know. So this is the only moment I, I get a little bit afraid. Otherwise, when people look at you, because, of course, sometimes you have to pass through some areas of uh, uh, turbulence. And if you go avoiding weather, all the aircraft in that area will go through that small corridor are you in. So all from the sudden, you are in a perfectly smooth cockpit and in 10 seconds or 10 minutes, you are in a crowded area, everybody shouting and you cannot speak on the radio and the weather is the same for you, everybody. And everybody looks at me at that moment. I cannot be afraid. I, can't, I cannot allow myself to be afraid that moment because I'm the last uh, resort, you know? So uh, this is one hand. On the second hand, when you see people getting afraid, you are more, uh, you, you anticipate more because of uh, your experience. I'm, I'm anticipating things more. Every pilot in an airplane, his mind is at least, at least 10 minutes or so 80 miles ahead of the aircraft. Right. At least, okay. if not more. Uh, literally, literally, you're in a flight and you're drinking your coffee. It's perfect, smooth flight. And your mind is always like this. Okay, I have uh, uh, Alps on my left. I have a minimum uh, route altitude there. On the right, how many aircraft? What if uh, what if my engine uh, will stop? One engine stops. What if both engines stop? This is uh, what, what the pilot will think all the time, chatting with the other pilot, looking at the instruments. But this is in the background. If they are not doing this, <laughs> something bad will happen. So for me, it's comfortable when I have to anticipate and people they look at me, uh, waiting for a, uh, an answer. So I'm not uh, giving the best answers all the time. But anticipating and having more experience will give me a, a more relaxed zone when I will, I will, I'm able to think well, to build my decision well, you know. Speaking of, oh, sorry. If, if I may, speaking of fear, there might be people out there who are maybe afraid to fly. And yeah. we have feedback from readers that after reading the book, that fear of flight has if not disappeared, that at least it has diminished. Because in the book, they discover the huge amounts of preparation that go before yes. 
behind every single flight. And the, we talk about how pilots are trained and we yes. talk about how many exams they need to take and about the certifications. And Emil is an, an accomplished pilot and also an examiner. Every pilot, twice a year, they go into the flight simulators and they have to perform certain tasks. If they fail, they're not allowed to fly. Uh, they prepare well, they don't fail. So people are telling us, oh, we read the book and now I'm even confident that those two people that are, uh, who are there in, in the cockpit, uh, they know what to do. And the, the whole uh, technicians and everybody in the airport, they also know what to do. And we talked about, we learned about how you communicate and how a plane is built and how... So... Uh, we wanted to open the doors a little, to open to open the curtains, uh, to put it better, and take readers behind the scenes a little bit to see the huge amounts. Because when you look at the sky, say, ah, it's nice and it's not that complicated from point A to point B. There's every success, which is a flight has a lot of work behind it. And that's true in aviation. And it has to be true uh, in our lives, whatever, whatever we're doing. It's interesting you're saying that because your credibility comes partly from your experience, your training, and the way that you are able to reassure people that they trust you. And as we speak, there is a big case in the United States of somebody who was faking it until they made it, which was one of these mantras in the early 20th century, 21st century you know if you the way that you make it is to fake it first of all but we know possibly because we're a little bit older mm. that you've got to put the work in yeah <laughs> look um every time i'm uh, behind the crew in my full fly simulator examining them I have a instructor operating seat with two touch screens and other controls so I can control the flu fly simulator, giving them the exactly have all the feelings they have in a real aircraft. In five to ten minutes, they are so into the flight that if I if they crash or something, the aircraft the simulator has a crash inhibit button. So if they crash, God forbid, in the full fly simulator, they fail, but they will not die. But if this happens, they are so. <clears throat> Uh, emotion and stress that we cannot continue immediately. You have to wait for another yeah. 10 minutes or so. So this is a, a, every time I'm sitting there because they are so focused in, uh, uh, in their job, in their uh, mission to succeed, I can see their character sometimes, you know, because they are so focused. They are tunnel vision in a way to perform well so we can see how they are as a human, you know, as a, as a person. Some of them are um, um, selfish. <clears throat> some of them, may be, maybe they are weak or in some, some ways. You can see this because they, they lose all the armor we have, all the inhib inhibition we have when we are on the, uh, in real life, in, uh, between our colleagues or in the family, we have some uh, uh, armor or some inhibition, we hide ourselves. But there, they are so concentrated in doing well that you can see how they really are. So it's, it's really, how I say, for me, as an experienced examiner, it's very hard to fake it <laughs> in the simulator. Yeah. You either... <laughs> And listeners, don't you, aren't you reassured by that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, they should be because uh, even if they see, maybe they're waiting in the at the gate and they see the crew coming and they might see a very young co-pilot. If they see the young co-pilot coming to the plane, they have three, that young co-pilot, uh, man or woman or is super prepared and trained and willing to be there. This is not like a, a normal day job somewhere uh, processing paper. I don't feel like it. I'm going to leave it and I'm losing. No, 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 no. If they, they're not, they're, the tests are so high because the stakes are high. Yeah, right? absolutely. It, they're carrying 200 souls with them or 100 or 400. Um, and then um, um, companies 
even uh, can go bankrupt because of one accident if it yes. shows that they did not take the proper precautions from all perspectives. So the stakes are very, very high. So companies make sure that whoever's piloting and co-piloting, they're good, they're equipped, they're willing to be there, they're well paid, they're well rested, they, they sign a ton of papers, they go to te- they go through tests. So it's, uh, yeah, it's not a job like uh, uh, just an ordinary other job. Yeah. And you you know there's so much emphasis on the preparation not exclusively the training that you have but the day-to-day preparation it's like Uh, a performance um uh, it has been said that in aviation we when an incident occur or an accident there are many many reasons up to 50 70 reasons or coincidences that we call in the book to for an accident to happen And uh, my solution to that is that um, uh, the question is uh, how many good coincidences happen when you have a good flight? Maybe the same amount, isn't it? If you put them on the paper, the way you leave your home, the way you uh, are uh, rested, the way you leave your home, your mood in a a way to the aircraft, uh, the way you communicate and uh, or in your relation with your colleagues on the ground, the way you do your briefing, the way you prepare the flight, everything. This, these are uh, good coincidences. You know, every small caution that uh, uh, will uh, address on the proper time, in a, um, on the proper moment. You know, not let them do not let them uh, uh, pile on top of each other. No, no, it's a, just a caution light. You don't have to Im- immediately address it. Yeah, that's right, but. What happens if you have more than two or three or four? What happens if you are distracted? What happens if something went, goes wrong uh, or from the sudden? You have the, this amount and this amount and this amount. Why? Why not address them in a, uh, um, on the proper time? So this is my, my answer to, uh, let's say, um, to those who ask me, how, how do you pre- prepare for a flight? Uh, how can you, it's hard, hazardous, how can you, be sure you will not uh, uh, crash or something because you, you know uh, it's not uh, the flight are only for birds, you know, uh, not for a big chunk of metals to fly with hundreds of miles per hour. Yeah, this is my answer. Preparing not just my training, not just my knowledge to keep or my skills to be at the right moment or the right level, but also day to day, the way I'm leaving home, the way I'm um, uh, doing my job, you know, this is the way I, uh, my, um, this is my answer for those uh, who ask this. So it's almost a way of life, isn't it? We talk about an athlete, for example, having a way of life with their nutrition, the way that they train, the way that they rest. It sounds as though there are similarities. There are many life. similarities. Yeah, yeah, there are many similarities. Yeah, because it's, it's, it requires a certain level of discipline that you have to do every day. It's not like, oh, on Mondays I don't prepare because I prepared. No, every single day has to be um, approached in the right way. He told me that sometimes he, was, he had flights on Christmas Day or he had flights on the birthday of one of his kids or he had flights when one of uh, the kids was left home, uh, maybe a little sick, uh, but he had to be on the yeah. When he's flying, he's flying. And I had to I had the pleasure to, if I may give a 30 seconds example, I had the pleasure to be with him in, uh, in a flight simulator. And... Um, It was in a different city. We traveled, we had fun with three more friends. Everything was fine. We were telling jokes and everything. The second we entered the simulator, Emil became a different man. He told us, uh, and the simulator is a a three step by three steps. So maybe two meter by two meter, a little room and everything. The second we enter, he said, okay, the emergency uh, exit is here, which was the entrance was we just used. So it was obvious that that's what it, and one of the guys in the room laughed and said, excuse me, the emergency exit is here, here's what we do. So, so while we're at the dinner, we are at dinner. While we're in the simulator, we take it seriously because that's the only way to properly yeah. do something. Yeah. yeah, it's absolutely right. Now the book is called Dark Cockpit. You do yeah. have a story related 
to what dark cockpit is. Could you share yeah, that? Yeah, we do you? actually. Uh, let me start and then I'll... Uh, so um, when we began writing the book, we did not begin with the title. We said, we'll worry later about the title. Let's focus on the content. Let's make sure it's valuable and so on. So we made a list of <laughs> the subjects we want to cover. And by then I knew some expressions that we wanted to use and things like that. And um, towards the end of writing the book, we came up with um, two possible titles. One was, this is your captain speaking. And the other one was dark cockpit, which was an expression that appear, does appear in several times yes. throughout the book. In the end, we did not go uh, with this is your captain speaking for, for two reasons. One, because we like dark cockpit more, but, but also because we did not want to come across as arrogant, talking about communication, right? It could be interpreted like, okay, you shut up now, you take notes because yes. the captain will tell you what to do. We will not do that because the whole um, tone of the book is friendly. It's here's how it's done in aviation. Here's Here's why um, we suggest you do it, but in the end it's here. So dark cockpit is an expression from aviation, it has a little mystery behind it. And actually it's a good thing, right? By the name, if for those of us who have watched the movie, uh, Lord of the Rings with the dark tower of Sauron and other things, oh, what's it? but it's a good thing. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll pass the mic to uh, Emil to describe um, what it is, but it's an expression that is from aviation and that fits nicely to all of us outside aviation. It's kind of what we want to achieve. And uh, Emil will uh, give more details, I think. Yeah. Uh, first of all, we didn't write the book for the pilots or only for the pilots. We wrote the book for uh, generic pilots, for you. Because uh, everybody's uh, flying their career, everybody's flying their family, and they, have, they must have a, a, a cockpit somewhere, a point uh, or a place where they are conducting things. And dark cockpit is an aviation term, meaning that every lights, all the lights are uh, extinguished. There's no emergency lights, which are red, and they are accompanied by um, a continuous repetitive chime. You heard it from the, in the movie, like ding, 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 ding. That means uh, there's emergency. You have a red light blinking and you have to immediately act on uh, some systems or you don't have a, a amber light a caution light which means a, it's a minor defect you cannot uh, you can you can delay it you know there's no uh, other lights like blue lights mean, mean, meaning that there's deliberately set on like the uh, ice in the aircraft which means extra consumption uh, you cannot take it or give it to like this to stay like this for a long run and all this relate to other people in aviation. Of course, you can have a white light in your, in your cockpit, meaning that your partner is on off. It was set to off or he's in off. But when you look at your overhead panel, you immediately see that uh, there's a light there. So when you do things properly, when you run uh, things smoothly, when everything goes perfect, you're in dark cockpit. Every time you have a light, immediately you see it because otherwise everything is extinguished. You have only the, the lights, the ambiental lights to let you see around you. But when you have a light in your cockpit, immediately you react and see the color is a color code. Immediately you realize what the, the, that light is, what system goes wrong. So it's better to have a, um, a way to see it so quickly uh, because it, it will give you... Per It'll give you the liberty of uh, um, acting properly to let you think, you know. And uh, on the opposition of the dark cockpit, there's a Christmas cockpit, as we call it, when you are um, you have in a, you're in an environment where all the lights are, are lit, so you then you cannot you cannot cope with this. It's a lot of stress. Of course, your performance is diminished. Yeah. Of course, your attention uh, uh, is uh, very weak. You know, of course, you are in tunnel vision for some items and you lose others. You are not in control. So when you're in dark cockpit, you're in control. I think that the analogy is superb. Now, before we finish the interview, I always ask my guests for three top tips related to communication. So it could be, you know, my first tip is listening to everybody. I pass this over to you both. Super. You want to you want to start, Emil, or shall I? Octavian, please. Yeah. So, um, number one, 
if you write something to someone, whether it's an email or a WhatsApp message or something, be sure to spend an extra 15 seconds or whatever it takes to reread it. And not just for uh, spelling errors or whatever, but rereading with with the mind of um, um, the person that you're sending it to. Uh, if, what are they likely to interpret that you didn't mean? So then if you need to add one extra paragraph or to rephrase something, please do that. So before you send something, don't, don't just say, oh, I'm busy. I have a hundred things to do. Yes, you'll have a hundred and one things to do if they misunderstand something and they call you and you'll have to attend to that because they're angry or they did not get the message or whatever. So number one, reread uh, before you send. It's for the sake of everybody. And we also like uh, when we receive a message, we kind of like it more when it's neatly organized and so forth. Number one. Number two, um, clarify with the other person uh, whenever you're unsure. Don't be afraid to ask, excuse me, uh, are you saying that or uh, what is it? Just make sure because it's better to spend a little extra time now than to uh, spend more time late or to work on a direction that is wrong and spend resources or, or other time. So these would be uh, two tips. And uh, number three, um, whenever it can be verbal rather than written, call somebody, especially it's a if it's a delicate discussion or bad news, don't do it by mail because again, who knows what mood might they, they might be in when they read it better yeah. to call them or even meet them in person if you can't meet them over zoom it's or google meets whatever it is it's very easy for everyone today because then the communication is richer you can see them they can see you you see their body language and it's easier to navigate the communication thank you very much for those three they're excellent tips thank you thank you Susan. And for me first of all will be the to accept the feedback so the criticism as somebody will call them accept the feedback because this will give you the opportunity to see more, to perform better and to uh, take better decisions, if, especially in, when you work in team, in a, in a group of persons. Secondly is uh, uh, the communication in a business matter should be impersonal and focus on the future to solve things as a pilot, as pilot do. And third, be honest. Because when you're honest and you speak frankly and you are open, uh, this will uh, encourage people to, to discuss more, to communicate better. And this will only bond together better a team. Oh, brilliant. I mean, you know, so much content just from those, those six points. Before we, fin before we finish, can you tell the listeners a little bit about the book? Uh, sure. The book is available on Amazon um, um, in the UK, worldwide, Amazon.com, as a paperback version or Kindle version. Um, soon, it will also be available in uh, audiobook version, but for the Brilliant. moment, it's, it's these two. The book is a how-to book, right? So it's not a technical book for pilots. It's not one of those book that, books that discusses endlessly the causes of uh, the biggest uh, tragedies in aviation. It's not a biography, so it's not meant to be a biography or a, um, a base for a screenplay with some uh, Denzel Washington actor or Tom Hanks uh, doing anything. Not I that he deserve you. to have a movie made after him, but that's yeah. not what the book. Who do you it's, want a how to? it's a how-to book. It's it's practical. Uh, it has advice um, on almost every page, and it's meant to help people who want to uh, go further and achieve more, to go there faster and to do better with good relationship and with a lower level of stress. Brilliant. And do you want to add anything, Emil? I will simply want my our, our listeners today uh, to read at least the chapter which uh, we put on the darkcockpitbook.com to get an idea about what the book is all about. Because uh, when they will realize how important to fly or to uh, live in a dark cockpit, how important it is to know your cockpit in that way, um, they will um, they will love the book because the book it's a how to uh, kind of book but it's not giving uh, as i said the, uh, previously it's not something uh, to look down on somebody to say look we are doing this way and if you don't do this way you'll be wrong or you you'll crash 
the book is uh, very easy to read. Yes. And uh, as I told so many times today, we accept feedback. We have uh, the, our emails on the book. So we accept feedback. We are waiting for the, our readers' uh, feedbacks so, because uh, maybe the book will become better. Yeah. Oh. And, uh, People are if 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 anybody or any from our everyone from our listeners they has questions of different kinds or they are afraid to fly or for whatever the reason they they want to get in touch with us they can reach us in two places either on darkcockpitbook.com there's a contact form we see it we reply the next day the latest or they are welcome to find us on LinkedIn Emil Dobrovolsky and myself Octavian Pantish we're available there uh, Emil uh, has it as as his personal. Um, uh, give back effort to help people who are afraid to fly not be afraid to fly anymore so if anybody uh, is in that situation we'd love to be in touch and help what fantastic human beings you both are i have really enjoyed the interview with you the book honestly i am really enjoying reading it and listeners I highly recommend it. I don't always highly recommend all of the books that are, but this is quite special and I know will be of huge value to all of you listeners. So thank you very, very much, Octavian and Emil, for coming on to the Superstar Communicator podcast. Thank you very much and all the best to everyone who's listening. Thank you and be in the dark cockpit. Yes. Thank you. Well, I knew you would enjoy this interview and I hope you've got loads from it. So as a result of this interview, what is the first thing you are going to do if you are leading a team? And if you are not leading a team at the moment, what are you going to do as self-leadership? because there are plenty of things that you could start to do that they have shared with you today. So before we finish, remember that you can join me once a month in the Lunch and Learns. Register at superstarcommunicator.com forward slash webinar dash interest. I will make sure that I put the link in the notes for this particular podcast and there will also be a transcription from this particular interview. So if you decide you want to read it. So until next time, thanks for listening. Take care. You have been listening to the Superstar Communicator podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and review the podcast on iTunes and on apps. Please contact us if you want to discuss any topic could suggest a topic for us to include or a guest who could come onto the podcast go to superstarcommunicator.com <laughs>